Swift's premium canned meats. Meat makes the meal, and Swift makes such good canned meats. And American Motors, builders of Rambler, Nash, Hudson Automobiles, and Calvinator Home Appliances. Present Walt Disney's Disneyland. As you enter this timeless land, one of these many worlds will open to you. Tomorrowland, promise of things to come. Fantasyland, the happiest kingdom of them all. Frontierland, tall tales and true from the legendary past. Adventureland, the wonder world of nature's own realm. Presenting this week from Adventureland, behind the scenes with Bess Parker. Children, time to eat. Prem for lunch. What makes them move so fast? Swift's Prem, the double flavor luncheon meat with juicy pork and tender beef. Swift's Prem is the perfect answer to quick to prepare delicious meals, long on flavor, short on fuss. Or slice and serve for delicious, fresh and tender Prem sandwiches to eat at home or in a picnic. Tomorrow, get several cans of delicious Swift's Prem and look for all the other quick fixin', good eating Swift's premium canned meats. Chopped beef, extra lean and extra tender. Beef sandwich sticks, wonderful for lip smacking hot beef sandwiches. And Swift's Premium Ham, the famous boneless ham. For quick to prepare delicious sandwich snacks and meals, remember, meat makes the meal. And Swift makes such good canned meats. They're all from Swift to serve your family better. And now, your host, Walt Disney. When I was a boy in Missouri, I liked to listen to old soldiers who'd fought in the Civil War. We had both Confederate and Union veterans in our town, and my loyalties would go from General Lee to General Grant and back again, depending upon which side told the most exciting tale. Then I ran across the book in the family library called The Great Locomotive Chase by William Pittenger. This was an eyewitness account, too. A Civil War story that did full justice to both sides. What's more, this story was about spies and trains. I've always been fascinated by locomotives. The older, the better. Down at Disneyland, we have the Santa Fe Disneyland Railroad, a 5 8 scale model after early Santa Fe trains. The engines, very much like these famous Civil War engines, the Texas and the General. I guess it was inevitable that someday we would make a motion picture about trains. And naturally, it had to be the great locomotive chase. For that old Civil War story simply related as factual history has all the elements of the wildest romance. An Atlanta newspaper of the time called it the most thrilling railroad adventure that has ever occurred on the American continent. We've tried to live up to that 1862 belly. Since Fess Parker recreates the role of Andrews the Spy, the principal character in our true life historical adventure, I'm going to ask him to tell you the story behind the story. I think we'll find Fess in his dressing room. Hi. Mr. Disney told me I was to play the part of another real American, James J. Andrews. I began to read up on him. I find he isn't as well known as Davy Crockett and other heroes of our history but instead belongs to those hundreds of brave and dedicated men who've had their day of glory and since been forgotten. Andrews was an amazing man, and he's explored a fantastic affair. But perhaps the easiest way to tell you what he did would be to show you a scene from our feature motion picture, The Great Locomotive Chase. Andrews was a Union spy, and in the scene that follows, He's reporting to General Mitchell, the commander of the Union forces at Nashville. The general has orders to guard Nashville, but on the basis of Andrews' report, he suddenly sees a chance to capture Chattanooga. 
Suppose we have a look, Andrews, and see how matters stand. Here's Lee, who has his hands full in Virginia. And here's Beauregard, who's bringing up everything he's got to fight Grant at Shiloh. And here's their east-west railroad. All the way from Alexandria to Memphis. With Chattanooga right in the strategic center. And here we are. So if I moved down here to Huntsville, captured the locomotives and the flat cars, and rode into Chattanooga, all I'd have to fear would be these forces out of Atlanta. That's true, sir. But we're right back where we started from. They can move their soldiers up along the railroad from Atlanta and drive you out of Chattanooga in two days. There are 11 railroad bridges over the Chickamauga. A man like you could lead a raiding party and burn those bridges for me. Why not? I had an understanding with General Buell that when I brought him this information, I wouldn't go south anymore. As soon as I complete this report, I aim to enlist in the 21st Ohio. Mr. Andrews, I wouldn't detail any man on a duty of this kind against his will. But consider what it might mean to the Union. Cut the Confederacy in two. We could shorten the war by half. Maybe end it. That night, a score of adventurous men, most of them from the 21st and 33rd Ohio Infantry, met Andrews on a hillside where he gave them their orders. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All here, Mr. Andrews. All I can tell the rest of you at present is that while General Mitchell is moving toward Chattanooga, we must penetrate more than 100 miles behind the Confederate lines in Georgia to destroy the railroad. If we fail, every one of us may be hanged or torn in pieces by an angry mob. You have no experience at playing the part of spies. Some of you are pretty young. And since we're asking you to volunteer blindly, it won't be considered dishonorable for you to back out now. Well, they didn't back out. And those Ohio farm boys conducted themselves so gallantly that they won our country's most coveted decoration the Congressional Medal of Honor. This was the first time the Medal of Honor was ever awarded. That's history. And it plays its part in our motion picture story of the Andrews Raid. But right now we have another story to tell you. The story of how we filmed the great locomotive chase. It's a big job. We had to run the race all over again, and we had to photograph it. I found what went on behind the cameras mighty interesting. And I hope you will, too. For a locomotive chase, we had to have the locomotives, of course. One to portray the general, shown here as it looked in 1862. And another to play the Texas of Civil War days. And so, we began to search for two old wood burners of the proper vintage. A railroad roundhouse would seem a good place to go looking for a locomotive. And in the yards of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, we located the perfect actor for the part of the general. This was the William Mason, an actual Civil War locomotive 100 years old. Now retired, this proud old campaigner served during the 1860s in the vicinity of Harper's Ferry. We were lucky. We couldn't have found a better type to play the general. Across the continent, meanwhile, in the Union Pacific Yards at Los Angeles, the old Enyo was being brought out of retirement for the role of the Texas. Here was another genuine old-timer, this one dating from the days of the Comstock Load and the Nevada Silver Mines. Here we had an actor we felt we could count on. In fact, Walt Disney used it once before in his picture, So Dear to My Heart. Our search was over. This was the player to reenact the role of the Texas. But every actor must dress the part. And soon the Disney back lot was filled with cow catchers, headlamps, all the necessary paraphernalia of an 1862 railroad. Soon paint began to appear on everything. In the old days, headlamps were a special work of art. Indeed, the decorator thought nothing of turning out a genuine oil painting usually some scene typical of the country through which the locomotive traveled. 
and the smokestacks had to be touched up too. The so-called balloon stack was the hallmark of the wood-burning locomotive. And that balloon-like screen over the top was to keep embers from escaping and setting the countryside on fire. Topped off with these contraptions, our locomotives really began to get in character. They were almost ready to take the stage, except for one small detail yet to be attended to. In their day, no locomotive was considered ready for public appearance without a nameplate. And so these were provided. Dressed for their roles at last, the recreated general in Texas stood in ancient splendor, gleaming like museum pieces. With their brasswork polished and their wood boxes full and steam up, they were ready for the star performances of their lives. There's something new, something new about Swift Prem. It's easier to open. Prem has a new unwinding tape that can't slip off the key. See, it runs in its own channel. New Prem also is easier to get out of the can. Watch this. Just tilt and Prem glides out. No fuss, no bother. All Swift's Prem now comes to you in this new easy open, easy out can. And of course, Prem is still that same family favorite for tasty round-the-clock meals. That delicious combination of juicy pork and tender lean beef that makes such tempting sandwich snacks or such hearty, nourishing hot meals in a jiffy. Reach for Swift's Prem at your favorite food store in the new Easy Open, Easy Out can. Easy Open, Easy Out. Swift's Prem by Swift to serve your family better. Well, we now had two of our main actors. Our next problem was to find a railroad to run them on. Our story required a single track with a dirt roadbed, old-fashioned telegraph poles carrying a single wire, and stations to match. In fact, it had to be a Civil War railroad. Oddly enough, we found it right here in the region where our story actually happened. So now I'd like to take you on location to the Blue Ridge Mountain country of northern Georgia. Here in the heart of the Deep South lies some of the prettiest country you ever want to see. Winding through this rural setting, there runs a single track railroad of a sort that's hard to find nowadays. This is the Tallulah Falls Railroad, or the TF Line, also known in these parts as the total failure. People everywhere love to kid their own railroads, but I warn you, don't try it here if you come from anywhere but Georgia. These pictures were taken on our scouting trip. And the moment we saw this romantic country, we knew we'd found the place for our story. For one thing, there were old wooden trestles with the dozens, 41 of them, in fact. And these suited our plans perfectly, for our story had to have trestles. One of the objectives of the Andrews Raiders was to burn the bridges behind them as they fled northward with their captive locomotive. Incidentally, we didn't actually burn any of these, but they did provide the proper background. On every side, there were echoes of another century. In this rustic setting, life goes on much as it did in Civil War days. And often, the old ways are still the best. Oxen are a practical answer to lots of problems, performing some jobs better than horses. But horses have their place too. Here a well-trained logging horse works without reins. He obeys spoken commands, if you know how to talk to horses. It's sorghum country too. And after the stalks are cut, they're put into a horse-driven sorghum grinder. This squeezes out the juice. And later at the cooking shed, it's made into syrup by slow cooking over a wood fire. This is an old, old process that's been used since earliest plantation days. There's a peacefulness to this country that's hard to beat. This is where a stream is a branch. 
and along every branch, nature's critters are right at home. Scenes like this, in fact, were the favorite haunt of Burr Rabbit and Burr Fox in the Joel Chandler Harris stories. A good coon country, too. There goes the grandson of my old Davy Crockett hat now. If I were still playing that part, I'd grin him right up a tree for you. But since I'm James J. Andrews this time, I'll let him go about his business. It was in a peaceful setting such as this that the Andrews raid occurred. And so for the time being, the Tallulah Falls Railroad was to become the Western and Atlantic, while we reenacted the great chase of 1862. And here come our locomotives ready to renew the old rivalry. On location, you run into some funny problems, and we had one now. How to get our locomotives off their flat cars. We dug a trench and laid some track in it and ran the flat cars down this ramp until they matched ground level. Then we towed our rolling stock onto the roadbed and we were ready to go. Well, almost ready. Nobody was sure yet whether our old wood burners could turn out the speed demanded by the story. And we also had to find out if this lightweight track could take such speed. And so a trial run was in order. But the test went well, and our old locomotives performed like the veterans they were. In fact, before our picture was finished, they clocked a thousand miles like this, going at a boiler-bursting pace. During the test, the most fascinated spectator was Walt Disney himself, a great fancier of old trains. He made it a point to be on hand to check every factual detail. On location, production problems are endless. Yet Mr. Disney seemed to have time for everything, including on-the-spot interviews. And in return, this visiting drama critic found time to play a part in our motion picture. And to get into the spirit of things, Walt wore a Confederate hat all the time he was on location. In coming to Georgia, we found ourselves on the home ground to the man who knows most about the great locomotive chase. And it was only natural that he should become our technical advisor during production. His name is Wilbur Kurtz. And here he shows a Confederate soldier how to hold his rifle. Historian, scholar, artist. Wilbur Kurtz is a friendly man. So let's visit him in his studio in Atlanta. Oh, Mr. Kurtz. Hello, Fess. I've been telling these people about your hobby. Is it true you actually knew six members of the Andrews Raiding Party, men portrayed by our cast in the Great Locomotive Chase? Yes, I did. Some years ago, I met and talked with six of the surviving raiders. Brown and Knight, the two engineers, William Bensinger, Jacob Parrott, Daniel Dorsey, and John Reed Porter. Mr. Kurtz, you're the recognized authority on this exciting event in the war between the states. How'd you happen to become so interested in it? From reading a story in the old Chicago Record Herald of September 1903. After reading this story, I purchased a Pittenger book. On reading that, I decided that there was a great deal to that story which hadn't gotten into print. Being an artist of sorts, I visualized several incidents of the raid. This represents the locomotive of Texas at the tunnel. Having no opportunity to turn the engine around, they had to pursue the captured general running in reverse. Any other interesting sidelights to the story, Mr. Kurtz? Yes, there has been. This is my grandson, Wilbur Kurtz III. We call him Billy. Hello. Hello, Billy. Mr. Kurtz, do you mean your grandson is part of the story? Well, you might say that. Quite some years back, I came to Atlanta from up north to meet and talk with Captain William A. Fuller, who was the conductor of the train pulled by the locomotive general. While consulting with him, getting his side of the story, I met one of his daughters, Annie Laurie. Later, we married. 
Billy is my grandson and the great-grandson of Captain William A. Fuller. This represents the locomotive general at Big Shanty. What you see in this picture was described to me by Mrs. J.B. Sewell, the daughter of George Lacey, keeper of the hotel. The uh, type of building of the old hotel, the picket fence, the duck pond, and so forth. Taking our cue from Wilbur Kurtz's painting, we began the construction of the Lacey Hotel at Big Shanty. This was where the chase would begin, the place where Andrews would steal the train. And we wanted it to look completely authentic. So we called in experts in the art of making buildings look old. For instance, porch pillars were shaved and rounded till they looked worn and weathered. The building began to look like the real thing and already our locomotives were puffing with impatience. The Lacey Hotel of 1862. But wait, there was one thing missing, the whole second story. Well, here was the man to fix that in a hurry. In the profession, he's known as the map artist, and he's capable of some amazing optical illusions. up his sketch to match the perspective of the real building. Then he touches up his colors and shadows to match the time of day. In this line of work, you have to be fast and sure, but by means of this movie magic and with precisely the right camera angle, this is how the Lacey Hotel finally looked. By now we had our trains, our track, and our stations. It was time to begin thinking about the people in the story. Here in an open-air casting office, producer Larry Watkin and director Pete Lyon interview native Georgians as potential actors. For a true story of the South, we wanted real Southerners, looks, language, and all. Among these genuine Georgians were community leaders like Reverend J.E. Dillard, who took a part as a sort of thank you to Walt Disney for making moving pictures in good taste. In real life, he's a pastor of the Baptist Church in Clayton, Georgia. In our picture, he played the part of a preacher of the 1860s and played it well. Well enough, in fact, that he was soon being asked for his autograph like any dad in the wool movie star. For the boy fireman on the locomotive Texas, we chose a Clayton schoolboy, Doug Bleckley. He's 14 and a hustler. After school hours, he works in a cafe. And sometimes he tries his hand at being an actor. Here's your coffee, Mr. Bracken. Thank you, Henry. People from many walks of life help make our picture. In fact, there seem to be talent everywhere. A waitress in real life was our waitress in the Lacey Hotel. Our thespians included a charming lady from Atlanta, a couple of Clayton drugstore clerks, the porter of our hotel and the owner of the cafe where our boy fireman worked. One of our railroaders was the president of the Clayton Chamber of Commerce. Our recruits included the wife of a local grocer, a salesman whose line was puzzled, and Harvey Hester, who owns one of the most famous restaurants in the South. Mr. W.S. Bearden, the former mayor of Clayton, Georgia, turned in a fine performance as a crusty old switchman. And in our motion picture, he suspects me of not being all I pretend to be. And here's his big scene. Something's wrong. Something's bad wrong, I tell you. I tell you, I know Bill Fuller. There ain't a better man on the state road. He wouldn't be this late without letting us know. Why don't you telegraph Atlanta and find out? The line to the south's gone dead. Maybe our friend here can tell us why. Throw that switch now. No reckon I will. If you was all that you claimed to be, we'd have heard from the superintendent of the road about you. And I ain't a throwing no switch until we do. Maybe you'd like to meet the principals in our cast. Here, I'm playing James J. Andrews in the picture. And here, I'm in the wardrobe department being outfitted for the part. This is quite a change from the Davy Crockett Buckskins. 
The fine clothes of a southern gentleman sure feel good. You know, Andrews was in the Union Secret Service, and in order to carry out the bluff of being a top official on the railroad, he had to dress the part. In 1862, toting these saddlebags was the same as a government official today carrying a dispatch case. Thank you. Too high, Fess. You could never get under the roof of the engine cab. I guess you're right. Folks, this is John Lepton. Casting has been completed, and John's playing the part of William Pittenger. Tell me about it, John. Well, Pittenger was one of the soldiers who volunteered to go along on the Andrews raid. A gentle, sensitive man who later became a minister. He was a constant reader and wrote very well himself. I've been reading one of his books on the raid. Without your spectacles? Oh. All through the raid, and for that matter, all through the Civil War, Pittenger wore spectacles just like these. When our technical advisor, Wilbur Kurtz, first saw John, he thought he was meeting Pittenger's son. The resemblance was so remarkable. Thank you. Too low. Well, speaking of hats, hey, be careful of that. That's my lucky piece, my Mike Fink hat. You couldn't wear it in this picture. It doesn't suit your role as Campbell. Mike Fink in the last picture we made for Mr. Disney, Davy Crockett's keelboat race. He gave me a lot of trouble then, but maybe it'll be different this time. From one southern gentleman to another fest, that's a mighty fine looking outfit you got on. Well, thank you, sir. Well, you're welcome, sir. The Andrews raid would have succeeded without opposition if it hadn't been for a young Confederate conductor, William Fuller, played by Jeff Hunter. Hi, y'all. Jeff, would you like to tell them about your part in the great locomotive chase? Well, I, uh, I really had to do a lot of running after that stolen locomotive. You see, uh, Fuller was 26 at the time, and he was a civilian because his railroad job was of vital importance to the Confederacy. You don't look much like a railroading man to me. Conductors never dress like that. Well, but they did then. The trainmen wore ordinary clothes. Except, of course, sometimes the engineers and the firemen would wear a cap that's very similar to that used in the Air Force today, about the insignia. And though uniforms were not worn, the conductor was oftentimes called captain, just like the captain of a ship. Jeff, you were telling us about the chase. Oh, yes. On that morning in 1862, Fuller had been put in charge of a mixed train running from Atlanta to Chattanooga, with the general as his locomotive. Now, when Andrews and his men stole the general at Big Shanty, Fuller thought at first that the train had been taken by deserters from the Confederate Army, and that made him hopping mad. He wasn't going to stand still for anybody stealing his train. You mean he was so mule-headed he started chasing a locomotive on foot? As I said, uh, I do a lot of running. <laughs> Anyone would know you couldn't catch a locomotive that way. Well, he did. He had to commandeer a push car and three other locomotives before he succeeded. Well, the last one, the Texas, was run backward for 51 miles at top speed. Both the general and the Texas broke some speed records. Well, I'm looking forward to that chase. Everybody ready? Yeah, sure. Uh, be right with you. Just for luck. pilots refreshed with milk. At this Air Defense Command base, it's milk after a mission for these Air Force Sabre Jet pilots. Madison Square Garden, New York. Ice Capade stars refreshed with milk after a long performance. It's ice cold milk for the Ice Capades. Chicago, Illinois. Chicago Bears refreshed with milk. These pro football stars call on milk for cool refreshment after the final gun. And across the nation, active people everywhere are discovering one beverage that's naturally refreshing. That one beverage is milk. Cold, refreshing milk. 
The natural sugar and proteins of milk release their energy more slowly, so milk gives you a lift that lasts longer. Milk cools you off and keeps you cool. Next time, refresh with milk. Ice cold milk. You never outgrow your need for milk. Milk is high in protein, high in calcium. And naturally refreshing. Well, the shooting is about to begin. We've got them all together. Crew, camera, actors, props, and two valiant old locomotives. Now we're ready to restage the great locomotive chase. First, we'll go behind the cameras. And then we'll see some scenes from the motion picture itself. From the beginning, the general and the Texas were in their element, puffing in and out of stations, playing their roles to the hilt. But almost immediately, we ran into an unexpected production headache. In using completely authentic equipment, we found ourselves with another problem. Our railroad was running all right, but it was running without brakes. The locomotives of the 1860s had no brakes to speak of, and the only practical way to stop was to throw the big drive wheels into reverse. Well, this not only gave the actors some edgy moments, but it made riding on the camera car even more of a thrill. One mix-up in signals, and somebody was apt to get run over. As production went along, there was action aplenty. In fact, Jeff York, who was once a professional fighter, had his hands full in trying to take on all the Johnny Rebs at once. And of course, I had to get my licks in too. Making movies is both fun and hard work. And one of the hardest parts, believe it or not, is waiting between shots. That's when you study your lines. Or maybe you try to read your mail while you're being mussed up to fit the action. Then there are endless rehearsals. The men playing the Raiders had to practice this scene dozens of times, carrying this heavy railroad rail. And they were more than glad to have Jeff York on their side, because he was strong enough to tote it alone. This is a stunt that takes a giant like Jeff and a prop rail like this. Between takes, Jeff Hunter talked over the fine points of chasing trains with William A. Fuller II, the son of the energetic conductor who ran the original foot race with a locomotive. Between acts, the extras often entertained with a spontaneous old-fashioned hoedown. The partners here are an Atlanta society lady and an old-timer who helped build the railroad before she was born. When there was music in the air, I generally went looking for my sidekick, Lenny Gear. He was cast as the fireman who helped me steal the train. And here he's been trimmed up for the part. Then he's a music man in his off-duty hours, a regular hepcat. Everybody called him Daddy-O because he spoke nothing but bebop slang. Every chance we could, we'd get off in the corner and rehearse the songs we were doing the picture. Let's do tenning tonight. How about starting us off, Stan?
how about Stan Song, railroad man? I rode 10,000 miles of rusty rails on my family was a railroad man. And I never had no homes at the county jail because my family was a railroad man. Yeah, it's cool, but it wasn't the most. Now, if we'd have just had little Bebop to pop Saruni up the situation, the Civil War wouldn't have been so square. <laughs> like this. Well, I met a gal in Boston. It's right on to me. Called her happy was the racist man. Do it. Switch me ball. Switch me down in Tennessee. Electronic cooking is here. Yes, electronic cooking is ready for you today. Now you can cook with radio microwaves instead of heat. Bake cupcakes in 30 seconds. Cook eggs without water in 20 seconds. Bake a potato in four minutes instead of 45 minutes. It's no dream of the future. It's Kelvinator's electronic range. Out of the laboratory and ready for your kitchen today. You've never seen anything like its incredible speed. And it's so easy to use. You simply put in the food, turn on the Kelvinator electronic range, set the timer, and that's it. The range turns itself off. All foods are cooked to delicious perfection. A 10-pound turkey comes out brown to a turn, juicy as can be. Cooking time, only one hour. Nothing gets hot but the food. The range walls stay cool, your kitchen stays cool. And you can cook on china dishes. Plain paper plates do a thousand and one wonderful new things. This is Hilary Brooks, urging you to get the whole story from your Kelvinator dealer tomorrow and see how Kelvinator's leadership in home cooking development is evident in every Kelvinator electric range. Another reason why American Motors means more for Americans. Well, we've seen the preliminaries bits and pieces. Now let's put them together and relive the excitement of the most thrilling of railroad adventures. When a railroad fan like Walt Disney makes a movie about spies and old time trains, the combination's bound to mean entertainment. Of course, there isn't time to tell the whole Technicolor story now, but here's a taste of the epic adventure. How do you like this business? one side that I can't get used to, Mr. McIntyre, the widow woman who fed us and gave us her bed. When I deceive him, I feel like the lowest snake that crawls. It's worse when a southerner's your best friend. I go with Jim Lindsay. How do you stand it? I believe in a federal union. So do I. I hope we can preserve it without any more Shilohs. They say the slaughter was so fierce on both sides you could walk across the field on dead bodies like stepping stones. How would you like to put a stop to that, Bettinger? Could we with what we're doing? Maybe we can. of a spy story is suspense. And at one point in the picture, Andrews and his men find themselves riding south in the midst of Confederate soldiers on the very railroad they intend to wreck. We are on the rolling down the line. We go where we're a man to go. Right now we're inclined to go home and rest itself. 
But when we're tired of eating, we will give them Yanks a beating, and they'll all be retreating when they hear the rebel yell. It's a touchy moment, and the trigger temper of Big Bill Campbell almost gives them away. How many Yankees can one southern a whoop? How many? That's more like it. Why, one company of southerners armed with pop guns could run a whole regiment of Yankees clean out of the country. Am I right? Right. You know? No? So maybe I'd get your seat. No, just stretch. Look at that kid. Would you mind? Don't be honorary, Bill. Go and let him see him. Yankee Army issue. Where'd you get it? I say, where'd you get it? Took it off a dead yank. Which battle? Battle for our hand coop. That's all any of them Yankees are. Chicken stealers. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that? Chicken stealers. <laughs> take breakfast with us. Well, thank you, but I've already eaten. My name's William Fuller. Well, have a good meal now, Mr. Fuller, and don't worry about deserters. I'll take care of your train. At Big Shanty, Andrew's daring plan was put into operation. He'd chosen this place because there was no telegraph here. And more important, it was a breakfast stop for the train crew as well as the passengers. A startling aspect of Andrew's strategy was that he aimed to steal a train right from under the noses of a Confederate regiment camped beside the track. This is a historical fact, the way it happened in real life. And it took a man with ice water in his veins to carry out such a scheme. from Beauregard, we can't keep the general waiting. of William Fuller, the Southern conductor. Fuller knew he had to get another locomotive and get it the hard way. First, he took a hand car from a track crew. Then he commandeered a yard engine. I told you, I told you. There were Yankee spies. How many were there? Four. Try to get a message through to every station up the line. Quick. They're probably cutting the wires right now. Come on, boys. 
Next, he climbed aboard a passenger train on a siding. And when he found himself balked by a roadblock the Raiders had left behind, it looked as though he was licked. Enter the Texas. into a dance, Bill. We'll drop these cars off at a siding. Bring her back, Pete. We'll explain later. Watch my signals now. At last, Fuller had a locomotive equal to the speedy Jenny, and the chase was on. Audience, Fuller had the Yankees on the run. The problem now was to intercept them up the line. Want you to take down a telegram to General Danville Ledbetter at Chattanooga. When we get to Dalton, we'll drop you off so you can send it. My train was captured by federal spies making for Chattanooga, possibly hoping to burn the bridges behind them. My train was captured by federal spies who are making for Chattanooga, possibly hoping to burn the bridges behind them. If I do not capture them, try to head them off. Signed, William A. Fuller. So that's why Mitchell hasn't attacked me. He wants to be sure those bridges are out. Acknowledge and send this message back. Now cut it to the next pole and take a length with us. Nobody will catch us in. The line to Dalton has gone dead, sir. The Raiders tried every trick they could think of in their desperate attempt to stop the Texas. Around a blind curve, Andrews laid another trap, a hidden barrier to throw the speeding Texas into the ditch. began to get discouraged by Andrew's seeming reluctance to fight. As soldiers, they wanted to have it out with their pursuer. It's time the Army showed the Secret Service how to fight. I'm going to stop this train. Campbell, nobody's going to stop this train until we reach the first Chickamauga Bridge. I know it's hard on you men. I've been tempted to stop, too. But we can't risk any encounter that might lose us our engine. For even after we burn the bridges, we've got to get through to Mitchell and let him know. You needn't worry about us, Mr. Andrews. Any of us. In desperation, the Raiders played a trump card. In this battle of wits, the fate of Andrews' plan hung in the balance, and Andrews knew it. seemed able to sidestep every disaster. The Raiders hadn't reckoned with his skill as a railroad man. Sight! Can you get another mile out of her? I don't know. All right, boys, you've been spoiling for a fight. Might as well have it now. Jump down and get a barricade across the track. strategy, and yet the cool daring of Andrews and his men was matched by the bulldog tenacity of William Fuller. 
The lion-hearted Southern conductor was determined to run the Raiders to Earth, and run them to Earth he did. Why don't you go downstairs and ask the captain of the guard to lend you his master key? Then you'll have something to go by. We're tending tonight on the old campground. Give us a song to cheer. Our weary hearts, a song of home. And friends we love so dear. Many are the hearts. Hey, look. Look what nice you Try and sneak out of here one by one. Only the first will get away. All the rest will be cornered. That's right. How would you go at it, Pittenger? I'd wait until around supper time when it's still light enough to see what we're doing. I'd grab Mr. Turner, take his keys, and rush the guards outside in a body. Good. It's all right. What do you think, Mr. Andrews? Yes, it's a good plan. Go ahead, Pittenger. It'll be sudden. Bare hands against muskets they won't expect. <laughs> Congressional Medal of Honor. You gentlemen are to have the first ever given. Their story lives on in the American heritage. And for as long as courage and steady purpose shall stir the mind and heart, people will remember and retell with pride the thrilling adventure of the great locomotive chase. It's a station wagon. It's a four-door. It's a Rambler. Yes, it's the new Rambler cross-country station wagon, smartest new car on the American highway. It's winning more new buyers every day by packing more glamour and more value into one car than was ever thought possible. No car at any price can approach Rambler's distinctive lines or its special charm. None can maneuver like this or turn so easily in so small a space. And most exciting of all, none can equal Rambler for sheer luxury. For example, even on the hottest days, these folks arrive relaxed, fresh from the comfort of Rambler's refrigerated air conditioning. En route, roads turn carpet smooth because Rambler has much deeper coiled springs on all four wheels. There are even airliner reclining seats that go as far down as you like to nap the youngsters or tilt to rest the driver's back. And those spacious seats have plenty of room for six six-footers. Rambler's the perfect family car, a really fine car with all the conveniences you could ask for. Power steering, power brakes, high dramatic transmission. Add to this Rambler's low price, small operating cost, and top trade-in value, and you know why so many thousands are making the smart switch for 56 to Rambler. See the new Rambler cross-country station wagon, the new four-door hardtop sedan, and all the other exciting new Rambler models at your Nash dealers, at your Hudson dealers. Next week, Disneyland will be brought to you by the all-new, all-American Rambler, the smart switch for 56, sold and serviced at all Hudson dealers and Nash dealers of American Motors, and your local dairy farmers in this area through the American Dairy Association, reminding you to drink one, two, three glasses of milk a day. You never outgrow your need for milk. Soon, you and your family can see Walt Disney's Davy Crockett and the River Pirates. And on the same program, Walt Disney's Man in Space, 
an amazing featurette of outer space travel of the future. There's action, fun, and adventure when Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier, clashes with Big Mike Fink, king of the river, in Davy Crockett and the River Pirates with Bess Parker, Buddy Epson, Jeff York. Davy Crockett and the River Pirates plus Man in Space, both in color by Technicolor. Look in your newspaper for theater names and showtime. This has been an ABC Television Network film presentation.